Hello, welcome to Footprint. My name is Samuel Atavensa. We've been having some wonderful conversations with Professor Kwame Kakari, and um, if you missed the first episode, you can go back to uh, YouTube and check it out. But for now, we are here to continue with the conversation. We'll take this break. When we come back, Prof will be on to tell his story. Welcome back. Prof, good to see you again. Thank you very much. Um, you know, lots of people watching and hearing your story uh, find it very intriguing mm. and how uh, a young boy from Wisa <laughs> uh, traversing the length and breadth of the country in the north, Navrongo, Tamale, all these places, you know, that again shows why you are so deep in terms of your judgment and your experiences because you've seen it from different angles. You reckon? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. See, um, I think I know or I have passed through or slept in perhaps every district capital in this country. Wow. Because of my membership in the 1960s to the 70s, early 70s, when I was uh, in Commander Training College, okay. uh, my membership in the Voluntary Work Camps Association. Oh, Volu, we call it. Volu, them. yes. Volu. Uh -huh. With so many of us young people who joined, you know, to engage in community yeah. development activities. So I traversed this whole country. Every holiday, uh, many of us would just put down our, our, our luggages at home and then just move on. Wow. In the early 60s, and I started the volume in about 62, 63, before the Nkrumah government was overthrown, we could travel on what they called the Young Pioneer, uh, uh, the young pioneer Ticket or something. There was um, uh, a rebate when uh, you used the government transport or public transport train and so on. That's if you are if a you member, member of the Young Pioneer. Young Pioneer. That, that was an extension of the CPP or something? Well, the a Young youth? Pioneer was a CPP's youth, youth organization. Okay. All right. All right. But because uh, the party and government declared later on in the 60s a one-party party state, state yeah. the assumption was that every young person would belong would to it. But anyway, okay. if you were a member of the Voluntary Work Camp Association, mm -hmm. you could also get this uh, rebate. rebate. So okay. you traveled Discounts. and paid a quarter of, of the, 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 the transport fare. Okay. Yeah. So we ran around this country everywhere, Laura, Hu, Ho Hoi, uh, name it, Wenchi, mm. uh, you know, WhatsApp, whatever. Okay, so, so now with all those experiences, Ghana is benefiting. Yeah, well, <laughs> I hope so. Um, so, also in our last episode, we talked about your how you superintended over uh, GBC within that period. Now, curiously, you were there at the time when the deportation order. Um, of Ghanaians living in Nigeria. One million uh, plus. Yes, yeah. that we counted over one million yeah. uh, Ghanaians returning, yeah. um, forced to return yeah. to Ghana within a short period of time, yes. right? Yes, yes. Um, now I'm asking because being in charge of the only state-owned media, can you tell, walk us through that story, what brought this story about and how um, GBC was able to cover it. Let's also put it in the context of the, the government at the time. Mm -hmm. The PNDC, I think uh, these are some of the major achievements of that government. 1983, this was a young government uh, from military, you know, there was a lot of confusion many of the uh, state structures were, were, were not very strong. Uh, and yet, this government led by Rawlings was able to meet some major challenges. One, let's remember that in 1983, 
there were many disastrous uh, uh, experiences. There were fires, wildfires all over. Bush fires, bush fires all over the country. Them, bush fires like everywhere. what we are seeing in, in Turkey California or California. Yeah, yeah. All over this country. True, true, true. And uh, we did it, the fire service that we had then was nothing to talk about. Um, but through mobilization of communities, and again, since you, we are talking about GBC, GBC stations, the local stations were activated. One of the important things about GBC is that over the years, from colonial times, the station had gained experience of mobilizing the society for major national, local, or whatever activities that were beneficial to communities. So in 1983, when these disasters happened, GBC cranked up every morning. There were broadcasts, mm -hmm. you know, encouraging the citizens to get up and do things for the national and community uh, benefits. So um, when these Ghanaian uh, Ghanaians resident in Nigeria were uh, forced out in 1983. Again, it befell on GBC to mobilize the country here, mm -hmm. people from Aflao all the way, communities from Aflao to every part of the country to not to take you out, can you recall what triggered this deportation order? Well, you see, Nigeria, the Nigerian oil economy had hit a snag. Nigeria was beginning to have a downturn in its economy and so on. And, and I think the, the leader then was Shagari, I Shou think. Shagari, Shou that's Shagari correct. as a that's civilian correct. government. Yeah. And of course, in many parts of the world, when countries are catching economic hell, the, the obvious um, scapegoats are, are foreign workers, immigrants, and so on. And Nigeria took this decision to repatriate not only Ghanaians, but other West Africans. But for Ghana specifically, the, Ni the Nigerian government did that, knowing that the Nigerian population would support it as a retaliation to Buzia's aliens compliance order, which drove out hundreds of thousands of Nigerians who had made here their homes, who had been born here. Which was in 71. This was 71, yes. 71, 1971, so, uh, and that was just about 12 years later on. Part, yeah. It was still fresh okay. in the minds of Nigerians. So, so it felt like a retaliation. A, a retaliation for them. And so the Nigerian public also uh, supported the government uh, for that. Of course, generally, all community, most communities... But we didn't beat them here. Huh? Did we beat them? When uh, we, we... The aliens compliance order. I mean, uh, I was too young to remember. Well, that. there were some... There were some beating. <laughs> I, I don't think Ghanaians beat them up. But in Nigeria, but the they really beat us. Their, oh, yeah, Nigeria. They beat they us. All they did is say, oh, Morgana. Why exactly. did they say, oh, Morgana? They Even chase you before out. the repatriation... Yeah. You know, many Ghanaians suffered xenophobic attacks uh, mm -hmm. here and there. Mm -hmm. um, but so GBC mm -hmm. went, uh, took up the challenge and mobilized through radio, yeah. uh, a bit of TV to get Ghanaians, one, for people to donate items to yeah. support the Ghanaians who were coming in, blankets, food, this and that. Even though it was difficult, many Ghanaians rose to the challenge. At that moment, the interesting thing is that even though the PNDC wasn't very popular across board, Ghanaians realized that this was a national issue beyond the, 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 the PNDC, politics the politics, it, yeah. and rallied around. And GBC was in the center of mobilizing this public opinion and people to, 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 to help our brothers and sisters who I were, still have images of um, shiploads of yeah. people. Yeah. Was it just by water transport or you had Ghana uh, Airways and at all At that involved? time, the Blast Star Line was still uh, in Operate, existence. Yeah. 
So some ships were sent. Mm -hmm. The Ghana Airways also was in existence with mm -hmm. a few crafts, and yeah. they also, and, oh. and I remember that the government then sent also state transport buses wow. to the border, to the Aflau border, even to the, the Benin border, to bring yeah. some of these. And of course, the regular public the transport. Badagri. Badagri, Badagri yes. Badagri, yeah. Yes. The regular public transport hmm. system all were mobilized to go and, uh, and bring these people. You see, again, a major difficulty at the time was fuel shortages. Fuel shortages. So I remember the PNDC commanded whatever there was at all, mm -hmm. the, the Temaril refinery, to supply uh, these vehicles. all vehicles that were going to bring these uh, uh, Ghanaians from the different borders. Wow. You see, so it's an example of a, a national mobilization for mm. a good cause. Mm. You know, mm. a, a major uh, expression of, uh, of support for our own kith and kin. Mm -hmm. You know, and GBC played a big role in uh, promoting in, in the pro campaign. In promoting the campaign, mm -hmm. in giving the, the, the government's instructions, you know, on the hour and so on, every morning, every afternoon. And also, uh, one of the things GBC did was also not to highlight on any atrocities that Nigerians may have meted out to them, just so that we didn't whip up a xenophobic mm -hmm. uh, mentality in this country. Because there was no retaliation in Ghana at no, the no, time. No, no, there was no retaliation. Yeah. No, no, nobody attempted to target the Nigerian embassy or the few Nigerians who still lived in this country and so on. And in a few weeks, the whole problem, all the Ghanaians had been brought in. And, and some and, of and them came holding Omo. Oh, holding all kinds of things. Holding Omo. You are running away. You are yes. holding yeah, a, well, a box of Omo. Somebody that, holding a stereo. Because Omo, because at that time in 1983... Omo was called essential Sam, commodity. We, we didn't have soup. Oh, we had manager. Remember manager? <laughs> <laughs> we, well, we had all kinds of locally produced soup from the backyards and yes, so on. Yes. I remember some women were making soup in North Kanishi and elsewhere. Yeah, Kotobabi uh, and things. Yeah, all over the country, <laughs> you know. Uh, wow, the soap that way you use it to bath. Yeah, yeah, you, 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 you may become a white man yeah, in one week. Yeah, or you have some <laughs> rashes and yes, so on. Yes, yes, yes. Crude so will come after yeah. you. You know, the, the factories were not producing toothpaste, um, soap, and yeah, so on, yeah. because mainly of foreign exchange problems which has started way back in the middle or latter part of the Champon oh, the 70s. Uh, 70s. But we had, so, we had milk, we had everything during the Champon time. Oh, but getting to the end <coughs> of the Champon period yeah. and through Liman's uh, short term, short uh, yeah, administration, yeah. We were queuing for all of these things. Really? You we were queuing for uh, all well, of these I, I, things. I, I was young, but, but I, all I, of these I, I am thinking, I may be wrong, that the, the queuing properly so-called started under Rollins No, first. no, no. Really? They didn't start under Rollins. Started under a champong. The whole thing about hoarding oh, yeah. was yeah. there because there was enormous shortages. But I thought, again, it was... You remember a, that uh, uh, this boxer... Um, what's his name? Who won the featherweight championship? DK Poison. DK Poison yeah. recently got the loan he gave to a champion's government paid by yeah. Kufo's administration, uh, yeah. but Kufuado's Kufuado. administration because but, the but, government. But that had been contested by various governments in the last forty years. Whether it indeed was a loan. I mean, well, some money went to somebody. No, what, what I'm driving at is not the, the, the truthfulness okay, of okay, it. Okay, okay, okay. I'm driving at the fact that DK Poison tells us and his handlers tell us yeah. that that government... Was so broken. Took that money to import 
uh, these Don't things say. that but we are talking true. about. That, I mean, that that can't be far from the truth. Uh, yes. Remember the Chiavelli loan? Yes. You know, yes. some private individual yeah. sitting in Italy yeah. somewhere. A country goes yeah. to take money yeah. from him to go. Uh, yeah. And buy <laughs> sardines. Sardines. Ghana, yeah, bro. Yeah. Remember, Taking money from individuals. <laughs> talking about sardines, you know, uh, Kwame Kuma wrote in his book, The Dark Days in Ghana, that... Yes. Uh, if I knew that what Ghanaians wanted was, was milk and sardines, sardines, I wouldn't have put up a kusumbo. <laughs> we would have used all that money to buy what? you milk and sardines. <laughs> we just don't know what we want. No, that's no, that's no. my conclusion. Yeah, well, it's the, yeah. the, the, the taste uh, developed by colonialism and all of that. And mm -hmm. we, we are still but a champon brought back a refua. It's not a champion who brought back a rifle. No, I mean, a rifle was just. It, it was that, there, but people it, didn't. People didn't feel proud to. Again, because you see, the fishing industry mm -hmm. had virtually collapsed. Uh -huh. Fishermen couldn't get nets. Yeah, it was as true. bad as that. that is so they couldn't get the fish that we normally eat, and it was this rifle which was really fish that is not. Really, fish, it's, fish, it's, it's not fish, it's like it's, a container. I don't, I don't know how to call There's it. There's nothing inside, it's, it's trashy fish. Oh, a you see, you refer, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we've gone through things. This country, the country was eating a refua, yeah, a refua. Ah. And 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 you know, again, some of these things brought some developments in a positive way mm -hmm. because f there was enormous food shortages. The Akan communities, many of them started eating uh, some corn foods, particularly uh, uh, you know corn foods that were more common with the coastal people. Akle, for instance, of mm -hmm. course, you know they started eating akle. Of course, my people call it akwele, 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 or something like that. I know, I know. You know, my no, was. Very basic, uh, but you common. know, a proper answer, you need palm, pa palm nuts, palm yeah. soup to yeah. do it, yeah. and yeah. you need better fish than than than, that, a, than a rifle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so prof, um, I'm I'm, I'm actually talking to Prof. Kwame Kakari here, um, who has been many things in many fields, but um, key among which is um management of media and for management of media gbc has been key later i'll be talking about his um, experience with uh, the graphic corporation as well but just to round up on how the gbc covered um the deportation of Ghanaians. um so at the time it was just gbc re-echoing the government side of the story would you wind re rewinding the clock or fast forwarding to today's um, age, do you think the media would have covered this differently? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, you the mean, media we have today. You, ah! the, the, you mean the media we have today? The. Oh, the media we have today. Uh, there would have been differences. They would have lambasted government. Some, yes, yeah, some would have not. Would have even and introduced uh, ethnicity into it. The, oh yeah, yeah. Not only, uh, uh, but some. I mean, the worst of our media, for instance, would have even gone to town to tell lies that what government was saying was not true. Nobody has mm -hmm. been repatriated. You know, some of our media today would behave like that, yeah. just because they don't like the certain government. Yeah. And it doesn't matter what party it is. The media that is aligned to a party in opposition to the uh, ruling uh, party would lie, would do all kinds of things to, to discourage people from mobilizing for a national cause. It's a tragedy. It's a really what sad... What would you advise to the media? What I would say is that, yes, there ought to be in a multi-party situation, there will certainly be partisan media. There's nothing wrong with that. But like political parties, we must all try to define what national interest is, what is common, of common interest to all of us as a nation. You know, so that we, we, we can work together 
to bring up what is of interest to us. What is left is the fight for political power. That one, you can target the opponent political party, but you don't spoil what is of national interest, mm. uh, such as a major tragedy like this repatriation, the wildfires I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. A nation has basic interests. For instance, going to the Olympics, no matter what political uh, party mm -hmm. uh, a, a media house belongs to or sympathizes with, you can't bring politics into it. That is because, you see, uh, when we went to the World Cup the first time, my friend Nana Kwesi uh, Janapintin told me that he, he had just come from the UK where he had been living yeah, for a while. Yeah. And then he met some journalists from a media house I won't mention. And this sports journalist told him that, oh, I hope Ghana loses. You see, I mean, Ghana should never lose. Anybody who considers themselves a citizen of this country should never pray for Ghana to lose in any cause. You see, it doesn't matter what party you yeah. vote for or you, you are even a chairman or this of. Ghana is, is above everything else. Thank you, Prof. Um, I, I'm having a chat with Prof. Sakwame Kakari, and uh, on this one, uh, I mean, you, you've, you've nailed it right there. Um, my, my extension is that politicians should also stop taking credit, singular credit for some of these efforts. Because if you, you come and tell me that, ah, but it was under my tenure, I'm the only person who took Ghana to to, to, to uh, work up and all this. Somebody will also undo you. That's how it works, but yeah. you know, symbiotic in, in that yeah. sense. But we will take a short break. When we come back, we'll be moving on from GBC and how he ended up going back to um, run the School of Communication Studies. This is still Footprint. City TV is live. On DSTV, go to channel 363. On Go TV, access City TV on channel 182. On a digital TV, please press the menu button on the remote control and run a new search on your TV. Take note that without an antenna, you cannot access City TV on your television. City TV can be accessed on a free to air digital box like the Go TV and Star Times box. City TV. It's your world. Welcome back. This is Footprint. My name is Samuel Atamensa. Having a nice conversation with Professor Kwame Kakari. I know the name rings a bell because he's been in the news all for good reasons. Um, <laughs> you know. I hope. <laughs> Uh, Prof, so what, what, which year did you finally bow out of um, GBC as Director General? My time at GBC was two years and I think three months, from April 1982 to June 1984. So you see, all that time I had taken a leave of absence from the University of Ghana. Oh, okay. And so um, it was for two years. Uh, but um, in June, Rawlings sacked me from GBC. I didn't leave on my own, even though oh, okay. I wanted to leave and go back. To, but for whatever reason. What did you do? I, I, or what did you not do? Well, you see, the PNDC kept always changing certain people in certain positions. Uh, perhaps it was part of Rawlings' own way of, uh, of So you had the announcement on your, own, on your own radio that you had been sacked? Not only that, Rawlings came to the studio himself uh -huh. to get the announcement made. <laughs> and when the announcement was made, I think at the 6 o'clock news or something, he gave them a record to play. The, uh, the song was 
let us kiss and say goodbye. You know th that, uh, I think it was by Barry White or something like that. Oh, I don't let's remember. Let us kiss oh. and say goodbye. goodbye. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Rollins did that no, to you. He did that so to he sacked you and yeah. gave you a bare white song. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, the, in those days, you were appointed without no paper. Yeah. You were yeah. dismissed without, without no paper. explanation. Yeah. And, and if you were grieved, there was no shrug to go to yeah. or any court to go to. Well, you just count yourself blessed to be alive. Actually, I was happy out. that I was sent out. Mm -hmm. You see, because um, when I was appointed, uh, first Rollins asked me to go and head a graphic as editor. And I said, no. At the time, my wife was in hospital. Uh, so I said, no, this and that. So um, later on, he called me and said, uh, I want you to go to GBC. Hmm. GBC. If I couldn't go to graphic, GBC is a wilder card. <laughs> but I accepted to go because, first of all, in those days, I didn't think it was even safe or wise to keep saying no. No, and, and, no. and still be around. Man. Yeah, because um, <laughs> yeah, I've known hearing. Rollins politically before he made his coup. Mm -hmm. And I belonged also to a political organization, the New Democratic Movement, which had come out to say that none of its members should take a position of executive mm -hmm. decision making, minister, you know, all those things. But to head the media wasn't, I was under the executive, so I didn't, but even then, I wasn't too comfortable, comfortable yeah. but I took the position. I, I took the, the position mm -hmm. oh, then and yeah. then tried to do the best I can. Uh, it was running GBC in those days wasn't easy. I'm sure. So who took over from you, GBC? Uh, GBC, when I left, I think it was Mr. Fifi Hesse. Oh, okay. Yeah, Fifi Hesse. Okay. Okay. Fifi Hesse had been before. a director, director general of, before. Was it director of? No, TV Director or? General of GBC okay. during the a period and uh, during their champion time. Mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, Fifi Hesse had been a secretary to a major institution, the, the um, Encyclopedia Africana Project, which was to do an African encyclopedia. I think they came up with one or two <coughs> volumes and that was it had been set up and done Cromwell. If yes, it was a brilliant, I think, a historian. Mm. And um, so he replaced me after okay. uh, I left, yeah. yeah. And what did you do after you went back to university? In those Ghana? days, if the PNDC removed you from an office, they asked you to come to the castle. But I, ref I decided not to go to the castle. I remember one time, um, one Mr. Opokua Champo, who used to work at the um, Castle Information Bureau. It's like the, uh, today, the Presidential Communication uh, mm -hmm. uh, Unit or something like that. He and a lady called um, um, uh, Ghanaian, European, Ghanaian, uh, Valerie Saki. Valerie Saki is the Saki. name you are trying to. Yes, Valerie yeah, Valerie Saki. Yeah. Uh, were there. Pukwe Champong came to say that, look, you've been asked to come back, and why are you not coming? And I said, no, no, I'm going to the university. So I went back to the, uh, to, to the University of Ghana, back to the, 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 depart the School of Communication Studies. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So how, was, uh, how were you received um, by oh. the university? <coughs> Uh, oh, there was community. no problem because... Well, when they were mainly anti-Rollins um, dominating... Uh, the faculty, yes, mm -hmm. the, 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 the top academics and so on were not friendly at all with... Uh, uh, and you are definitely seen as a Rollins person. Uh, um, yes, of course, yeah. of course. One of the Rollins persons and yeah. being in, in that... But uh, PAV and San, who was the director of the school did not 
show these kinds of sentiments towards me. But well, he would make fun, fun of yeah, yeah, yeah. P uh, you know, PAV as I was uh, much more broad-minded than that. Mm. You know, he looked at whatever I could offer. And in, in fact, when I went back, he said, Kwame, you have gained an experience that will be useful for this school. I want you to introduce a course called media management or min management of media organizations. Mm -hmm. So I used that opportunity to study a lot mm -hmm. from different books, different literature, you know, studying BBC, NBC in America, whatever. And then from my own experiences and so on, uh, developed a course you know, for the faculty, faculty board to approve. Now tell me a quick one. Um, you know, when we, anytime we heard of the University of Ghana School of Communication Studies, yeah. um, it couldn't be separated from the name Professor P. A. V. Ansa. Yes. Um, yeah, you know, you know, your own experiences with, who was this man, Professor Ansa? <laughs> P. A. V. Ansa was, in my estimation, a great Ghanaian, patriot and scholar. Uh, the university set up the School of Communication Studies because they wanted to introduce uh, journalism studies at a tertiary level. They started at the postgraduate level. First, the program was a, a graduate diploma, not a master's, a one-year postgraduate mm -hmm. diploma. And um, they brought initially, they didn't find um, people qualified according to the university's uh, criteria. So they brought some uh, um, American uh, scholars to start the, the program. But at the same time then, they sent two Ghanaian scholars, mm -hmm. Pierre Viansa, who was a, a, a scholar in French, literature, French language, French culture. And then uh, Dr. Yao Chumesi, uh, later Professor Yao Chumesi. Uh, Yao Which Chumesi, is a political science. Polit from political science mm -hmm. department. Another, you know, a, a very, very uh, great scholar in political science. Both of them were working on the, had worked, were working on the Legon Observer. Mm. So their introduction to that kind of journalism working with uh, Jones Quarte, who had been an old journalist and so on. The university sent these two gentlemen to the United States, University of Wisconsin, actually, to do a master's again. They all had their PhDs and so on, but they went to do a master's degree in communication studies and came back <coughs> and took over from the Americans who had started okay. the school. So PAV, uh, became the director of the place. When I came uh, in 1979, I worked with him for a year, and then he went on sabbatical. And uh, Yao Chumesi took over for the one year that uh, P.A.V. Ansan was away on sabbatical. And then um, when Yao Chumesi came back, uh, when uh, P.A.V. Ansan returned from sabbatical, Yao Chumesi also went out on sabbatical and, and so on. Now, the P.A.V. did very well in establishing the school. As I told you in our first uh, discussion, he came to interview me in New York uh, to come and teach journalism, uh, mainly print journalism and so on. And, um, but PAV made a number of contributions to communication studies, but also the in, some of the communications industry in this country. For instance, I can say, and I'm sure members of the Professional Organization of Public Relations will agree, that he introduced the teaching mm -hmm. and study of public relations in this country. Oh, okay. There were, it was quite an infant short industry. Courses, short courses. Short courses at best. 
but you didn't have people who really knew what they were about in terms of public relations. And he introduced the study. There, were, there, were, there was nobody to teach it. Mm -hmm. And Paul uh, really started teaching it. Wow. But the products from PAV's uh, tutorship became great, you know, public relations people. Remember some of them? Oh, yeah, yeah, Both yeah. Both public relations, Late, journalism. Uh, 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 Alote, uh, Alote Papo. Alote Papo was, uh, uh, I think, a leader of the uh, Public Relations Association of Ghana for, for some For a time. long time, yeah. Yes. But, okay, so currently... There are many people, uh, Mr. Kujoyanka, you know, later oh. minister. Mr. Kujoyanka was a student there too? Uh, in fact, Kujoyanka was one of the pioneers of the School of, of, the School of Communication oh, okay. Studies. Okay. Uh, so he, he founded um, AUCC, AUCC, right? yes. He founded AUCC, but mm -hmm. he was also, if you remember, under uh, the first NDC government. Yeah. He was, I think, the regional he, he, minister. He was for Deputy Ashanti Regional Minister and then, then Regional then Minister. Then Regional Minister. Yeah, he was and Deputy also, to Nyama Donko. Yes. And then yeah. took over later on. Yeah, took over later on. And then yeah. later on, or before then, or maybe under the PNDC, he was also the regional secretary in the central region. That's correct. Yes. That's correct. In fact, it was yeah. his time in the central region that they worked to bring this uh, panafest, you know, into the country. That's true. Yeah. That's and there true. were a number of others. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because I only remember Kweku Sechiado and... Uh, oh, Kweku didn't go into PR, of course. Kweku, no, no, I'm talking about journalism. Yes, yes. Yeah, Kweku, yeah, yeah, he also came to the School of, yeah. uh, of Journalism. And Audrey Gajepo, right? Audrey didn't come study there. Student. She, she came there came as teach. a teacher. Okay. In fact, okay. when Audrey came, I think PAV had died. Oh, So wow. I, I employed Audrey oh, okay. Uh, okay. when I was uh, heading Head. the school. But that, the you employed Nanaya Ofuriata as well. Nanaya Ofuriata, <laughs> yes. She came there for... Hi, uh, Nanaya. <laughs> Nanaya was there to teach, for, but for a very short, short time. time. Yes, I think from came. the U.S. or U.K. somewhere. I like that. think she came from the U uh, U.K. U.K. Yeah, because okay. Nanaya had gone to LSC, London LSC, School yeah. of Economics, and, Economics and but had Public done journalism. Science. Very mm -hmm. brilliant uh, young woman, really strong you lady. Know, yeah. Those two women <laughs> on your staff, you can imagine. You know, really excited. Mm. <laughs> yes. So PAV, he also introduced the teaching of advertising wow. in the school and produced many of the good advertisers, wow. including wow. Uh, Mr. Kweku Mensabunsu, Prime Time. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, who yeah. set up Prime Time. Prime Time advertising. Yes, advertising. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. The thing about the School of Communication Studies uh, is also was very strong in research, Correct. social science research, yeah. because we had some really great uh, research scholars, mm -hmm. or Queen, or Bing Quenu and others, Kwame Buafu, and so on and so forth. And so the graduates from that school were mm -hmm. very good in, in basic research, research quantitative okay. or qualitative, qualitative but yeah. people don't use those skills we very this well. Proper value on research. Exactly. At all. at all. In fact, in this country, we don't measure anything. No, but that's why everybody <laughs> says they are doing public opinion, you know, during the elections. <laughs> everybody wakes up. And yeah, they, do, they say, yeah, we have done research. <laughs> and our research findings are that if NDC doesn't win, MPP will win. You know, and if who you doesn't have, know that? <laughs> yeah, who doesn't know that? Yes. <laughs> anyway, so, so, Prof. Um, Back there, and then you became head of the yes. school. Um, which year did you finally leave the school of um, as, as the head of it? As the head. Faculty? I left in, I retired from the school in 2015. But I left as head um, about 20... 10 or so, okay. uh, around 2010. I don't remember the exact date, but about 2010. You see, I 
So let me ask, did you take over directly from PAV Ansa as yes. head? Yes. Okay. Because PAV Ansa fell ill. Yeah, for a while. Very yeah. sadly, you know, he... It was like an anticlimax oh, yes, to yes. so many things. Yes, and, and you see, the sadder thing is that he died so young. Yeah. With that big name, you would think that this was very was in old. Early fifties. He died when he was fifty-four or fifty-six. Yeah, yeah you know, yeah, which is yeah. really sad. Wow. He had a bad stroke, and in that. fact, I remember. I think it is to the uh, honor of Joyce Ayi that PAV didn't die in Canada when he had the stroke. I think PAV was in his hotel room in Canada and Joyce was somewhere in the United States and I learned from PAV and son's wife. She called PAV uh, in his hotel room, but when she called, uh, nobody was picking up the phone. No, he picked up the phone, but the, the, the voice wasn't very Audible, yeah. uh, good for him. So she called the reception. This is what the family told me. Joyce may uh, straighten it up or whatever. She called the reception that the guests she's trying to talk to, there is something wrong and they should check. And when they went into the room, uh, he had a, um, a stroke, attack, so yeah. they, they rushed him to the hospital. Wow. Then later on, he was brought back here when he recovered a bit. But uh, he didn't recover very fully. Mm. But even then, if you remember, when he got up a bit from the bed, he started writing all these, you know, sharp Ballistic articles writings to in the Ghanaian Chronicle the, 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 at the, the time. Chronicle, the Monday uh, Morning Terror or something like that. Yeah, he yes. had also, uh, yeah. I forget the name that he had, his column, uh, uh, I remember. Yes, uh, going, going to town. <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. Uh, so, people, you can get um, old copies of yeah. the Ghanaian Chronicle and yeah. look for... Actually, uh, we published those articles into a book. Yeah. His daughter... Dr. Isi Ansa. reissued yeah. that book. That's correct. Yes, That's so correct. I don't know if there are still copies somewhere to okay, buy. Okay, so um, you, it's the book you find that we have put on the screen now. There's a number there that I think every journalism student should look for this book and just read the writings of uh, Professor P. A. V. and yes. Sir. Yes. Um, take the number, go get the book and read. You thank me later. We'll take a short break. When we come back, it'll still um, we'll come to the rounding up of the story of Professor Kwame Karkari. This is Fact Finder from the BBC. We live in a world where news travels fast. And sometimes, it's hard to differentiate fact from fiction. Fact Finder brings fact-checking from the newsroom up close so you can separate truth from chaff. Be empowered to tell what's fake from what's real. Watch Fact Finder by the BBC on City TV every Wednesday at 6 p.m. City TV, it's your world. Welcome back, this is Footprints. My name is Samuel Atamens. I'm here with Professor Kwame Kakari. Uh, Prof, so you, you know, having superintended over um, the School of Communication Studies, uh, or prior engagement as head of GBC. Um, I think you stand in a position of having observed how the media in its f different forms have metamorphosed over the period, you know, from um, one state media to now multiples yeah. and getting out of control and all that and the relationship between the media and the and and the state or the governments mm. um mm. so you you are in a better position mm. to walk us through mm. 
Um, mm. What we now today can openly say media freedom. Yeah. And, and, and what have been your own experiences from your unique position? Um, I'll say that in Ghana, the media experience is it's been like in the center of our yearnings for freedom, democracy, decency, dignity, and all of that. Um, at the level of the professional practice of journalism, I think that the state-owned media, even under the most difficult times, showed a lot of professional uh, uh, quality. Professional quality in terms of the technicalities of journalism, mm -hmm. uh, the ethics of journalism. But that's not all there should be <clears throat> with journalism when it comes to democracy and the political destinies of nations. There must be the professional standards and quality ethical, respect for ethical norms and, and, and behavior. But in addition, the media must also have the independence to be critical of whatever is going on in the public space, especially in terms of what government does, what government says, what government thinks, and so on. Um, and express an alternative opinion. And express alternative, and also open up the, the media for what the constitution today says, dissenting views. Mm -hmm. Because so, so there is always dissenting views in society. You see, so that for instance, today, in this country today, one important test of the state-owned media in terms of adhering to the Constitution's edict of also giving voice to dissenting views is if the state-owned media, for instance, will allow a discussion of L LGBT issues. Mm -hmm. They should, because that's what the Constitution says. Yeah. And those who are for LGBTQ are a dissenting uh, 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 minority. Yeah. Will the state-owned media, Graphic, GBC, GTV, will they allow? But why not? That's exactly what I'm saying. I mean, saying. discussing is discussing. Uh, uh, I mean, discussing not, is yeah. discussing. It's yeah. not like proselytizing, like, yeah. you know, crusading mm -hmm. and so on. That would be a very important test. That's right. um, I had the president apparently uh, disturbed by people's complaints of um, uh, about what people were trying to say as culture of silence. Saying something upon Krumah had said earlier that when government expresses its views, mm -hmm. people are construing that to mean uh, uh, attacks on, on press freedom. Um, and then he cites Joy FM's activities con concerning Within a particular period, period yeah. concerning uh, the free senior high school. Yeah, yeah. I found that disappointing that a man like a Kufuado would see it that way. I don't think that we've had a president in this country whose pedigree has involved commitment to press freedom and freedom of expression, I mean, like a Kufuado. Mm -hmm. I know from you private mean, encounters with as him. As president. As president. Okay. Well, as a, even as a politician. As a politician, okay. Yes. Because I have had the privilege in private circumstances to have uh, some discussions with him on media issues. And for instance, when in the early 90s, Haruna Atta and Kwekubako were, were imprisoned on contempt, I think. Yeah, yeah. Under yeah, Rollins. Yeah. Yes. Ajima Rollins. Yes, yes, yeah. issue. And we formed uh, an ad hoc 
coalition called Friends of Freedom of Expression. Ekufuado, Jacob Bechebilamte, and Hakman Usuajima were very active participants in the activities of this uh, coalition. Mm -hmm. the, it, it was a coalition formed by us from the School of Communication Studies, the Ghana uh, Journalist Association, mm -hmm. and a, a, a number of other people. Um, and they were active in that. I'm, I'm mentioning this because that was a very activist yeah. participation, participation yeah. In, in, in issues of press Media, freedom. Yeah. 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 It was from there that in those interactions, people like him, Jake, and so on, developed the whole idea that all these laws must be kicked out of our, our statute books. So in the mid-90s, we saw the entry of private independent radio. Yes. Um, prior to that, you know, the, the loudest voices would have been um, print. Yes. As in Kofi Kumsin's, yeah. um, Tommy Thompson's Chronicle. Free Press. Free Press before, yeah, before Free Press yeah. or before Kofi Kumsin's, yeah, right? Yeah, it, it was way before Kofi yeah. Kumsin's, yes. So Free Press and then you had Chronicle yeah. and then later Cabral, Little. Yes. Uh, Independent, Independent yes. newspaper. And there were a number of papers. Actually, oh, yeah. that whole uh, transition or the, there was one paper that actually was the first to... You remember that before the new wave of newspaper, independent or private newspaper journalism, mm -hmm. in the years between the end of Lehman's government and 1980-81, when all these new mm -hmm. uh, independent papers came, what we had, because the PNDC law on newspaper licensing, licensing law yeah. mm -hmm. uh, was in force, there was no real independent newspaper. There was a newspaper, the Ghanaian Voice. The Ghanaian Voice. So, the one Chris Asha was. Uh, no, connected. that was owned by ooh, a man he died. I've forgotten the name. I'm sorry. Um, the Ghanaian Voice. Mm -hmm. The Ghanaian Voice, Dan Ansa. Dan Ansa. Dan Ansa. Yeah. 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 I remember Dan Ansa. But then, then there was the Echo. The, there was the echo. Yeah. You see, the echo was by an an old veteran journalist. Mm -hmm. I've uh, forgotten the name, but it was a reintroduction a of, 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 of a paper old, that had existed old, in the fifties and okay. so on. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the Nansas Ghanaian voice, voice yeah. was there. That's true. But that the true. way the government, the PNDC. Count than and size that one day they arrested him and put him in the in the in the guard room in the castle. That's true. It really threatened the hell out of his life. <sighs> so when he came back, he became a voice of the PNDC. He yeah. had to survive, and I'm sure he died out of uh, perhaps all of yeah. those frustrations. Yeah. Okay. Um, but then there was a paper that came out before all of that were. Sports newspapers and Lotto, and Lotto paper, newspapers. Lotto papers, yes. Lotto papers. Yes. They were everywhere. They were everywhere. <laughs> the sports newspapers, the significant thing about the sports newspapers were that they couldn't do politics. politics yeah. But they were doing some Aesopian journalism. Uh -huh. You know, writing sports with insinuations of politics. It was very crafty, very, yeah. very, it's something to study. Mm. A really crafty way of saying, uh, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. But then there, yeah. uh, there was a newspaper that came out before all of this. It mm. was called Young and Old. Oh, I see. You never it, saw that. Oh, uh, it never came out that. for a brief moment. Mm. Started to yeah. to talk about politics, politics but in a yeah. mild it way. Survive. And then uh, the others started. There was okay. some newspaper also called the Republic. Okay. But I, I think out. credit to Kofi Kumsin's yeah. um, job, and then yeah. he also was able to garner the support of all of you at yeah. the time. Yeah. Um, no, Kofi um, Kumsen yeah, yeah. is somebody to celebrate <laughs> for press freedom. <laughs> Nana Kofi Kumsen. Yes, Nana yeah, Kofi Kumsen. He's, he's a hard-headed journalist. True, 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 and, true, and, true. And brute, Fearless, man. <laughs> yeah, very hard-headed. You know, Good. one so must resolve. How about the, um, we're just about ending, but 
How about the introduction of independent radio at the time? Did it do anything for media freedom? Yes. Actually, it started with us at the School of Communication Studies, mm -hmm. organizing a national conference for the privatization of the airwaves. Yes, yeah. So we did that conference. Plenty of people came. I remember one of your, your good colleagues, late good colleagues, the man who started um, uh, Atlantis, Apia. Uh, James Apia. James Apia. Yeah, James, yeah. He was at the conference. Yeah, because it was he, there. He, his father worked with GBC and he yes. himself to GBC. Yes. So. It was there that Ureku Brobe announced that he was going to start a radio station by hook or crook. You know, so um, after that, he started Radio uh, I, Radio I, Radio I and, and all of that. Okay. Well, yes, I think the opening up of the airwaves have been very important for this country's democracy, development, and cultural um, advancement and so on. Of course, there are many problems like with everything, but the opening up of the airwaves have been amazing and the radio yes but even the venture into television is a major feat considering the financial and other resource yeah. uh, difficulties that it involves in fact one of the major difficulties of running television in this country just as radio also faced was finding the human resource to manage the stations, but also to produce programs, yeah. apart from the cost of producing programs. And this is where some of us hoped that the Media Development Fund that John Mahama set up would have come to help. No, it didn't. It no, didn't. it didn't. I mean, I it don't didn't. know, you know, Dr. Ayariga was minister and they, they just misbehaved with that fund. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so, Prof, in ending, with all the years you've spent working, supporting, campaigning, free speech, freedom of speech, media, and everything, what, how, how, what do you want to see change in the media? Right now, as we sit, I think we ought to have legislation on broadcasting. Legislation that consolidates the gains we have in terms of freedom of the media to operate. Legislation that also introduces some better democratic regulation mm -hmm. of the media landscape. We, we can't just allow things to go oh. as they are going. We don't mean regulation that should cripple a station here uh, through, you know, uh, lockdown radio stations, close down TV stations. Yeah, but, no. but, but, Doc, in the, in, Prof, in the Western world that we are trying to emulate, if you're a media house and you misbehave beyond a certain of point... Of course, of course. They will knock you off. Of course, of course. We, will, we cannot allow a radio exactly. station, for instance, that incites violence. So we, this thing of you can't close down a radio station no, is no, undemocratic. That, that, there's nothing that in a democracy cannot be closed down. <laughs> there's nothing. It must be according to the, the law, law that is also correct. humane, democratic, and acceptable by all sensible Fair. citizens. Fair. Yes. Fair. And Fair. go through the proper uh, processes of rule of law. Otherwise, I mean, why? Some things can be closed down now and again because they are doing things that not are not in, in the, the public interest. interest. Yes. Thank you very much, Prof. Sakwamika Kari. Well, it's been another exciting episode of Footprint. My name is Samuel Atamensa. You've been listening to Prof. Sakwamika Kari, a man who wore many hats doing many things to support and campaign for free speech and management of media. Thanks for watching. Thanks for joining us.